Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry for the late start. Uh, technical issues this time, which is the first time this has happened. Um, so I think we're, we've been very lucky so far. Um, and I'm sorry that Tatiana can't be translating as we speak. I'll be doing the um, seminar today without the translation, and Tatiana hopefully will do this um, later on. So I'm going to speak quite slowly, uh, and I'm going to give her gaps uh, to be able to translate, because I know that's how she works. So it may seem a little bit disjointed, but maybe this will work better for the translation later on. So we are going to be doing a deep dive today into what are called vascular pathologies of the neck. Now, we did something similar um, a few seminars back. And the reason I want to revisit this is because there's been a series of guidelines that have been released by the uh, International Federation of Orthopedic Manual Therapists uh, about this. Uh, and so I thought it was very, very important that you are up to date with the most recent um, guidelines and research and suggestions by a body of experts that is, 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 is international. So that's the reason I thought we would revisit this. So for those of you that were at my seminar when we talked about um, cranio, uh, sorry, cervical arterial disorders uh, and the relationship between osteopathy or manipulation and adverse events, you'll see that you may remember this particular slide, which has um, evidence of the impact of manipulation in some people very, very rarely that can result in effectively infarct um, of the brain. And you can see here, the hematoma, and this is in the internal carotid artery on the left-hand side, um, and it's formed a thrombus. Um, so you can see here is the the dissection is it's caused a thrombus uh, and it's led to damage, um, well, death obviously, uh, and an infarct stroke in the brain. Okay, and this was actually something that was a bilateral carotid artery dissection after cervical manipulation, and this took place in, in Belgium. Okay, so the challenge really is that these conditions are very rare, and I, and I will be going through the underlying statistics and, and case reports that we've got on these. Nonetheless, the consequences can be can be devastating. It, it, it can be the result of, it, it can cause death. So we're left in this really difficult situation where these are very, very rare. Consequently, the data around them and the, the patient profiling to be able to predict these is quite difficult to access. And yet, we need to be able to do the best possible job to stop us from missing people who are at risk of um, problems with arterial or vascular issues of the neck. That's the background, really, to the, the latest guidelines. So this is the framework. Um, we're going to go through the historic safety incidences. So in other words, what is there in the literature? Um, and we're going to try and go through what we understand now as being the most likely mechanism or the most likely underlying pathoanatomy that predisposes a person to problems with the arteries of the cervical spine. Now, just as a little note, the last time I did this lecture, um, I referred to it as cervical artery dysfunction, as you can see down here. CAD, but 
uh, within the literature in, in English, the word CAD is also known as coronary artery disease. So they've changed the name. It's the same thing, but they've now changed it to something called VPN or vascular pathologies of the neck. All right. So that's the, the thing that you might see is a little bit different. I have to say I'm, I'm used to saying CAD because that's what I was, if you like, raised or brought up with. Um, so I might I might mistakenly say that. But but whenever I say CAD, I am talking about cervical artery dysfunction. But that is synonymous with vascular pathologies of the neck. Um, I showed you this last time as well, if you were at my lecture. This was a, a paper that was done back in 2010, so what are we now, 12 years ago. And it was written by a, a guy called Edzard Ernst, who was the professor of medicine in Peninsula Medical School in the UK. And he was the first UK's professor of complementary medicine. And his, his remit was to look at the effectiveness and safety of complementary and alternative medicines within the UK. Um, and as it turned out, he became quite critical um, of what he referred to as bogus claims or claims that were not, were not true about what complementary and alternative medicine uh, said that they could treat or they could manage or conditions that they could cure. Um, and, and a particular profession that came under a lot of criticism was the chiropractic profession um, and I think I, I spoke last time about the number of quite well documented cases of people having suffered um, both uh, gross disability but also death following chiropractic management of their particular case there was one in in, in Canada in particular that sparked a whole uh, a whole um uh, conflict that, that went all the way up to uh, the, the government. So Ernst did this, this study in 2010, uh, and he looked at the numbers of published cases that were associated with manipulation and the uh, the outcome being death. Okay, and I want to just briefly show you these. <clears throat> in reality, he looked at um, numbers of incidents that were reported in the literature between 1934 and 2010, <clears throat> and he noticed that there were around about uh, 26 deaths, which means that's just under um, one death for every three years. So you can see how rare these incidences are, and, and that's that's globally, yeah? So that's in all of the published literature. Um, one death every 2.9 years, to be absolutely precise. This is a, a breakdown of those, and it's quite interesting to go through this. And again, I, I have shown this last time, but if we do a little bit of a deeper dive into the data, um, you'll see that there's a trend that starts to emerge. Um, all of the areas that are highlighted in red are those that are thrombogenic. So in other words, there's been some sort of embolism that's been set off and that's lodged and caused uh, an infarct. OK, um, and what you'll see that part of those are also associated with dissections. So you can see in the blue, you've got dissections of the vertebral artery. You've got a vertebral artery aneurysm, which is very similar to the first slide that I showed you. Um, and even in here, hemorrhages in the ventricular system and cere cerebellar hemorrhages. OK, so there are there is a trend of it being related to dissections and also thromboembolisms as a result of um, vascular issues. And of those, um, what's also very interesting is the time that it takes for the onset. So the it can it can range when in fact that's that's incorrect. You know, it, it, there's a, a within one hour um, we've got a problem in terms of the infarct of the brainstem. But more importantly, it can take nearly Two months, 58 days, um, nearly 60 days for, for it to show up. And that's a thrombosis in the basilar artery. So the onset of symptoms is incredibly variable. And this makes this makes it very challenging from a research point of view to, to prove um, causation. So did this cause the problem or 
did the person present with a thrombosis and the symptoms were similar to what we see and it was simply missed and that's the that's the the underlying conundrum with this okay um we've also got a couple of other interesting um issues both of which here are now hemorrhagic yeah so these are related to A tearing in the left lateral sinus, which is this one here, and intraspinal bleeding and compression of the spinal cord. So these two are the other types of strokes, which are the hemorrhagic strokes. Um, and you can see that these are in the minority. So the majority, all of the reds and the blues, are to do with dissection, dissecting events or non-dissecting events, both of which are related to thromboembolism. OK, as opposed to these last two, which are in green, which are related to um, hemorrhagic or, or splitting and bleeding of the, the vasculature. And it's interesting that um, what Ernst said here is that it, it, it's, you're able to, or there, there seems to be an association with people who have catastrophic effects following manipulation and you can trace it back to the profession which is very interesting so you can see here in in the paragraph that Ernst um, writes that the article summarized a total of 265 vascular accidents 142 of which were linked to chiropractors and another review of complications after neck manipulation published by 97 included 177 32 of which were fatal the vast majority of cases were associated with chiropractic and none with physiotherapy. And he goes on to speculate. The most obvious explanation for the dominance of chiropractic is that chiropractors routinely employ high velocity, shortly the thrusts on the upper spine with a rotational element, while the other healthcare professionals use them much more sparingly. So there does seem to be something about the, the manipulation um, and particularly the type of manipulation um, with this notion of high velocity. Um, and we're going to sort of talk a little bit about that later on because there seems to be some sort of relationship there which is worth exploring. So here was one that was on looking at the um, accidents with cervical manipulation that took place in China. And again, the stats are, are quite interesting. Um, there were 150 cases of injury that were support, reported in total. Um, 22 cases of them, 14%, included paralysis, death, and cerebrovascular accidents. So um, this is something that's acknowledged to be the case. And if anyone's been to China, um, I went there to study uh, acupuncture ooh, 20 years ago, I think now. Uh, and the thing that was really quite interesting <clears throat> is that uh, when we went out socially and, and, and had a tour around, um, a lot of um, barbers uh, were there and a lot of the men would go in to have shaves uh, or ha haircuts. And at the end of the treatment, they would have a hot towel placed over their, their, their face um, and then the art, when, when the towel was removed, they would finish the, the hair cutting session or the shaving session, and the barber would come up and would manipulate the neck both sides whilst sitting in the chair. Um, and that was something that was that was done by, um, by the barbers uh, uh, with every single client that went through. Uh, so I'm, I'm not surprised because Cervical manipulations are effectively were being were, were, were being administered on quite a quite a um, a common level. Okay, why is this a problem? Well, it seems to be that a lot of the symptoms that are associated with vascular um, problems of the neck will present practice masquerading as either neck pain or as headache. And unfortunately for us as practitioners, 
this is a very, very common presentation for patients that don't have vascular problems. So a person who, a patient who, who, who may be starting to have dissection or who may be starting to have early signs of a stroke, a bit unstable, they may experience neck pain, they may experience headache. And so who will they go to see? Well, of course, they'd go and see somebody who will deal with headaches and, 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 um, and neck pain. And, and those classically will be people like osteopaths or physiotherapists or chiropractors or manual therapists. So it's quite understandable how we will tend to see a higher than uh, normal um, number of people who have the potential for vascular problems with the, the, the neck um, arteries. And that was the aim of the underlying framework, the IFOMT framework, which is to increase our understanding of the risk and pathology. Uh, but the purpose for that is to improve safety for the patient uh, and also to make you more able to come to informed choices about when to refer on for um, ongoing investigations. Um, and also what's interesting is if you were familiar with IFOM, then you would have known that they had published um, a, a first iteration of this framework back, back in 2012. Um, and what they've done is they've, they've revised it. Um, and that's, that's interesting as well. So it's effectively an update. How does it work? Well, the, the, the problem, as I said right at the beginning, is that the number of incidences of these are fleetingly rare, thank God but they do occur. And, and the problem with that is that if they are so fleetingly rare, it's very, very difficult to prospectively or in advance um, design a, um, an ongoing study that will look for predictors uh, or outcomes related to this. So we rely very much on retrospective or backward looking um, case reports in the literature to be able to unpick how these things came along. So the literature is there, but it's it's very scarce and very thin because invariably it's done after the event took place. It's difficult to do it prospectively. And so the framework is based on what's known as a consensus document and a, a number of agreed experts in um, manual therapy plus experts in hematology plus experts in strokes came together to design uh, a very in-depth literature review. And the purpose of the frameworks are to blend the expert opinion with the literature to be able to provide a, um, a framework effectively to allow us to be able to um, come up with the most evidence-informed method of practice in these difficult circumstances. Uh, and the final framework was appraised by an independent medical practitioner specialising in strokes, especially those related to, to, to neck vasculature. So that's kind of the background to how this framework was developed. We're going to look at a number of sections. Um, it's how the framework is laid out. They look at patient history. They look at physical examination. They look at the risks and benefits of osteopathic manipulative therapy. OK, so by way of background, as I said, a lot of the problems with um, neck vascular problems is that they will present or patients will experience symptoms of classical musculoskeletal neck pain and classic musculoskeletal headaches. So. <clears throat> If you look at the lifetime prevalence of neck, 70% of the general population are at some stage in their lifetime going to experience neck pain. Okay. And on a, on a, a yearly um, prevalence rate, we're looking at 30% of the population out there right now who are experiencing neck pain. Okay. And if we dig deeper of those, 14% will have neck pain that is chronic. In other words, it, it, it exists more than six months. So that's the neck pain background in which our um, vascular problems of the neck are embedded within. 
let's look at the headache stats. And this is from the International Headache Society. So migraine, these are the three common ones. We've got migraine, tension type headaches, and cervicogenic headaches. Now migraine, um, this is known as the, I was quite surprised by this, this is the leading cause of disability in under 50 year olds. And it affects 1 billion people worldwide. There is a gender split. It's a, a three to one female to male ratio. So this, this is something that is quite common. It presents with a one-sided headache. And as we'll see later on, it's, it's very, it, it is a risk factor simply because it's very similar to problems that arise from the, the, uh, the neck vasculature. The second type of headache is what's known as a tension type headache. Um, uh, and this is regarded as the most prevalent neurological condition. Uh, and again, there's about 2 billion people worldwide that are thought to be um, suffering from tension type headaches. It's the second most common chronic disease globally. So that's two to, two to three percent of of the world's population will be suffering from tension type headaches. And there's not so much of a gender split here. There's, there's, there's slightly more um, females that are affected compared with males. And then finally, we've got the, the cervicogenic headaches. Now this is, this is technically a secondary headache. The first two, the migraines and the tension types are referred to as primary headaches. The cervicogenic, as the name implies, the genesis is in the cervical spine. So effectively, a cervicogenic headache is a secondary headache that's coming from nociceptive activation of structures in or around the cervical spine, typically uh, in the upper cervicals, because that's what refers up into the base of the neck. The estimated incidence here is around about 2.2% of the, of, the, of the population. So you can see that headaches really are very common, yeah, whether they be migraine, tensor type or cervicogenic. And, and there, there is the problem because, you know, we've got neck pain, which is very, very common. We've got headaches, which are very, very common. And we know that osteopathic manipulation or osteopathic manipulation, manipulative therapy is proven with effectiveness clinically for all of those problems. Yeah, so we know that OMT works for non-specific neck pain, it works for migraine, it works for tension type headaches, and it works for cervicogenic headaches too. So people are, who've got these problems are of course going to um, look for, for, for assistance, uh, and these, the OMT, the osteos, physios and chiropractors, and manipulative therapists are the people they will turn to for non-pharmacological management. So this is a, a um, uh, results from a paper that was written by um, Clark, um, and that wasn't as Bronford, put, and this was looking at the evidence behind the effectiveness of osteopathic and, and manipulative therapy for a number of disorders. And the thing that I wanted to pick up here is that acute and subacute acute and chronic neck pain, we've all got pretty pretty high or moderate positive evidence that um, manipulations and mobilizations and exercise uh, are all good for dealing with acute and chronic neck pain. What about headaches? Same thing. What we've got is migraines, cervicogenic, and the tension type headaches, a little bit unclear at that time. But recently, there's been a number of updates. This is done in 2004. Uh, six years later, there were some more updates. Um, there was these are the, the data that were up, updated in the evidence report. Uh, and what that did was it created a change to the recommendations. And you'll remember that previously the findings for tension type headache was inconclusive. However, when CLA did the upgrade, after looking at these, 
what they found was that there were some changes uh, which shifted the evidence from being inconclusive to now being moderate. And those were spinal mobilization for cervicogenic headaches, mobilizations for miscellaneous headaches. And within the miscellaneous headaches was tension type headaches. Um, the other one which we're not particularly interested in um, for today's topic is that it was also um, it, it shifted the, the notion that manipulation and mobilization with exercise for rotator cuff disorders now had um, moderate quality evidence to support the use of manual therapy in addition to exercise for rotator cuff. As I said, that's a sign. So these are the two things that changed in 2010 is that there, there is now evidence, moderate evidence, that the effect size of manual therapy for all the headaches is moderate, it's, it's good, it's there. So this is part of the background for why people with these problems will often seek out manual therapy, including osteopathy. Um, and in so doing, uh, bearing in mind the overlap, the masquerading of vascular pathologies of the necks, we have to be careful that we're able to do our best to, to tease out, to find those people that are at risk hidden within that huge, great um, prevalence of non-specific and innocent, benign um, neck pain and headaches. So this is a more recent um, update. This is 27, and this is looking at the adverse events associated with using cervical manipulation or mobilizations and the characteristics of the patients. And this is a systematic review. And this was part of the one of the core texts that the, the framework um, was formulated upon. So I want to just present to you um, the, the data from the, this particular paper, because I think it makes for interesting reading. So the first thing is that serious adverse events, so the, the term serious can be defined as um, an event that happens post-treatment, post-manipulation, that requires cessation of that treatment and or management by a different method. Okay, so it requires management of the symptoms that arise from or are as a result of the osteopathic um, techniques. And the first thing to note really is that they are rare, okay? And because they are rare, and as I said earlier, it's difficult to design a trial where we can, we can look in advance for problems coming up. We are reliant very much on um, individual case reports, typically coming in from vascular surgeons um, or emergency department practitioners who report on um, people that are presenting to these critical care units complaining of um, neck pain and, and headaches, but are actually coming from vascular pathologies related to the neck area. Consequently, the very nature of those reports means that the person presents to a and &E or presents to the surgeon with a problem, and they have to rely on the history, and they formulate a retrospective analysis of what went on. So it's, it's often um secondhand information it's very often as i said earlier based, based on surveys of, of, of neurologists um, and if we were able to do a prospective trial and and, and and we have done a few of them um i've published a, i think it's two papers on adverse events following osteopathic treatment in a teaching clinic where arguably you would say that, you know, uh, patients being managed by students who don't have high levels of skills or high levels of competence, they may well be um, more likely to experience adverse events compared with people that are being managed by competent, qualified, experienced practitioners. And even within those um, trials that we ran, um, the only adverse events, I say the only, the, the adverse events that we captured were all classified as mild. In other words, they didn't require any cessation of treatment, they didn't require any different management, and they self-resolved. There was no, there was no um, permanent change. 
Uh, and, and typically what we found was that actually 80% of our um, patients attending osteopathic clinic at the European school suffered mild self-limiting transient symptoms that resolved typically within a week. Um, and they tended to peak uh, around about 24 to 48 hours. And it's what we all know empirically as being you know, the treatment reaction. And we didn't have any um, serious um, non-resolving uh, adverse events within that study. And, and, and that effectively is, is, is the difficulty. And so consequently, when we do try to capture the data about an adverse event that is serious and estimate how, how, how much that risk is likely to be, the confidence intervals are very, very wide. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's part of the problem. And it makes it very, very uncertain for, for us as practitioners. So this particular paper um, located 144 case studies. And again, what's very interesting is that you can, you can look at the professions and you can look at the regions. They, they tease this all apart. Uh, and what you see here is these are the professions. So here's physiotherapy, here's osteopathy, and here is chiropractic. Okay, and you can see that the, the counts, these are the numbers of incidences, they're all how would we estimate that? So that's probably 10, so around about seven um, within the osteopathy, maybe five within the non-clinicians, physios, maybe. Seven as well, but chiropractic right the way out here, yeah? And interestingly, there is the ability to be able to differentiate into regions and it looks like that the, the blue one is the American and Canadian chiropractors are the ones that seem to be most associated with um, adverse events related to cervical manipulation. Okay, the green is the European Union chiropractors um, and they too are high but you know the, the American and Canadian, the North American um, chiropractors are double that of their European Union counterparts um, and that that's that uh, incident that I told you about that, that created a big um, political but also populist backlash against chiropractors took place in Canada um, and it was it was related to the death of a, a particular patient and more importantly the way that the chiropractic profession handled the backlash associated with it the publicity associated with it So again, if we look at the types of adverse events, and this is now differentiated according to gender, again, what we can see as you started to probably realize is that the biggest cause are dissection events, okay? Um, and again, you can see that there's almost twice the amount of incidences of females compared with males. So the light, the light gray is females, and the dark gray is males, okay? So these are dissection events, the VA stands for vertebral artery. Um, here's another one, dissection events of the internal carotid, okay? Thrombus, dissections, dissections, dissections. All right, so hidden within this is, is a lot of, <clears throat> issues related to vascular problems, okay? Um, in, in total, looking at all of those, vascular problems are the most common adverse, uh, are the most common mechanisms underlying um, adverse events associated with the cervical spine. Um, it's nearly 60% of all the cases here have a vascular component to them. Uh, and just over half are associated with, with um, females. Uh, so interestingly, if you look at the, the vertebral artery, you can see that the predominant gender effective is females. But if you look at the internal carotid artery, the predominant, uh, again, it's almost twice, two to one, is males, okay? Thrombus is more or less the same. This section slightly more females here, uh, external carotid, 
um, nothing in females, mostly males. Okay, uh, BA is basilar artery, ECA is external carotid artery. So there is definitely um, a vascular component that underlies everything, and there is, in total, um, some predisposition to males with vertebra with uh, carotid arteries, and some predisposition to females with vertebral arteries. But if you take it in the round, it's more or less 50-50. And these are the, it's a frequency table, so it's not a risk table, it's a frequency table of the signs and symptoms um, that people who've had adverse events, serious adverse events after spinal manipulation complain of, okay? So the biggest issue is related to voluntary movement. So there is a loss or change to voluntary movement of the upper and the lower limbs and also of the face. There's altered sensation. Okay, again, upper limb, lower limb, and or face. And pain. Okay. Then there's a series of changes to function, but this includes nausea, headaches, vomiting, vertigo, difficulty in speaking and swallowing, nystagmus, dizziness, and overt stroke. And then we have um, a series of other symptoms that include things like bowel or bladder problems, coma, fainting, deafness, death, thankfully, relatively low there, um, so on and so forth. All right. So these are the, the, the if you like, the, 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 the ones that we're going to be concentrating on in terms of the symptoms. They're the ones that are most important to be aware of. Okay, but taken in the round, the, the, the stats are somewhere between the risk of a stroke <clears throat> of that's related to cervical arterial disorders or um, vascular problems of the neck post manipulation is between 2.6 or 2.9 per 100,000 manipulations. Okay. Um, It happens in younger people. So traditionally, strokes are associated um, in the round um, as being associated with cardiovascular problems and in the older population. But actually, manipulative stuff occurs in people in their early 40s. And that's where they are slightly more um, high gender split and it's, it's pre predominantly males. So the other interesting thing is that it's more common in winter. So there is a there is a, a hint there that there's something else related to it um, that is seasonal. Uh, and some of the risk factors um, you won't be surprised with. One is hypertension. Well, of course, that is a, a cardiovascular problem that does raise the issue with um, atherosclerosis, a hardening of the arteries, less of a loss of flexibility and pliability. So when you are having somebody moving their neck around with a slightly rigid artery inside that, be it carotid or, or vertebral, then these are more likely to be stretched and then would tear. If there is a thrombus underlying it, it may dislodge the thrombus. So that stands to reason. <laughs> migraines are very interesting, but migraines, again, they are a vascular headache. We know this. So there's something going on with the 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 control of the diameter of the blood vessels within the cranium. Connective tissue disorder, that's another interesting one. Um, so if somebody comes in with hyperflexibility syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, it's important that we recognize that this affects um, joints. Yeah, of course. So they're going to be um, hyperflexible in all of their joints, but the connective tissue is found in the arteries. So it does mean that the arteries are also more likely to be fragile. And you'll recall that one of the um, one of the indicators or one of the um, issues that people who have got uh, connective tissue disorders are is that they will be quite prone to bruising or bleeding. Uh, and, and if they're female, will often present with very, very heavy periods, menorrhagia, because the 
the connective tissue found in the arterial walls is much more fragile, so they are more prone to, to having disruption and damage and breaking of the arteries, leading to the bruising, um, and um, fragility of the uterine arteries producing much heavier bleeding for periods. Um, so therefore, this fragility of the blood vessels means that they are much, much more at risk as well. I say much, much more. They are more at risk of having um, dissections of their arterial systems of the neck um, compared with the average population. So hyperflexibility, if you have patients with hyperflexibility who present with neck pain and headaches, it needs to raise a little bit of a red flag. The other thing that seems to be definitely related is recent neck trauma. And the classic one, of course, is road traffic accidents. Yeah. So there is an association, temporal association, with people presenting following a road traffic accident where there has been whiplash um, and then going on to um, develop um, dissection events in the, uh, the cranial cervical arteries in the, in the, in the vascular, vasculature of the neck. Uh, and what's most interesting, and we'll talk about this later on, is, is, the, is the magnitude of the force that takes place within road traffic accidents. And overall, around about 5% of cases um, of those serious adverse events actually ended up um, with fatalities. So <clears throat> what types of um, vascular problems in the neck are there. So we can see that there are quite an, a number of underlying pathologies that are vascular in nature, and all of these may well have an impact on the presentation. Okay, so you can see <clears throat> these are issues with the carotid arteries, these are issues with the vertebral arteries, temporal arteries cerebral vessels, and then other issues. Okay, so within the carotid arteries, we've got a, a number of things here, and it can be atherosclerosis, it can be stenosis, which may be congenital or acquired, thrombosis, aneurysms, typically after a dissection. Again, <clears throat> hyperplasia, which links with the stenosis. These are very often um, congenital. Uh, and then the dissections. Okay, now what's interesting is that the symptoms here are pain, 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 headache, um, neck pain, facial pain, headache. All right. Um, there are other uh, there are other symptoms, <clears throat> which is typically Horner syndrome um, that can occur with carotid arteries, and these are are things that need to be picked up on. Yeah, so if you come in, if a person comes in and they've got evidence of a Horner's syndrome or even a partial Horner's where you've got eyelid <clears throat> ptosis, the eyelid is, is drooping slightly, these should raise red flags immediately, but there may be something that is coming from the artery as opposed to something that is viral, all right? So assume that it's arterial rather than just a typical classic Horner's syndrome. The vertebral artery, again, issues with that. They may be atherosclerotic, so this is general cardiovascular problems. There may be something congenital. They may be prone to dissection, so it may be traumatic. But again, <clears throat> look at the symptoms. Neck pain <clears throat> and neck pain, headache and headache. Okay, so again, this is why they masquerade. They come in because of the innovation to the, the vessel walls. They will come in with neck pain and the the referral patterns for that neck pain will be up into the neck. So effectively, they will have a true cervicogenic um, nature to their headaches, all right, because of the referral. But the underlying nociceptive activation isn't within the musculoskeletal structures, but is embedded within the arterial walls. And if we briefly look at the other ones, <coughs> which are, are, are there, um, it's temporal pain and headaches. Um, Thunderclap headaches, sudden severe headaches, stiff neck, neck pain, headache, possible headache, neck pain. I mean, you, you, you see the trend. Um, throughout all of this, the, 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 the first symptoms tends to be related to cephalgia, some form of headache, and some form of neck pain. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, 
it's a challenge. And that's partly why the the um the framework was was designed was because these things are so common in, in terms of the symptoms. Just looking within the UK, you know, just looking at, at, at stats associated with strokes. Um, in the UK alone, um, there's about 152,000 strokes annually. So basically every five minutes. So we've been going on now for about an hour. So there's been 12 people that have suffered with strokes in the time that I've been presenting. Yeah, it's quite shocking. Um, luckily, um, the fatality rate is around about 20%. OK, so one in five of those um, are likely to, to die. Um, most of them are ischemic or clot related. And the, the minority are the hemorrhagic or the bleed related. And it's, it's these ones that we are particularly interested in. You'll remember from that first slide that the majority of those red circles were over thrombogenic problems, whether or not they were dissections or not. The main thing that caused the issue was the thrombosis it caused the infarct okay there were only two that were related to bleeds um, and they are definitely rare even within the um the vascular problems of the necks <clears throat> of those strokes um it's reckoned that about two percent of ischemic strokes so of this lot here only about 2% are, there's the old word, coron uh, cervical artery um, dissections, okay? So these are problems with the internal carotid typically or your, um, your vertebral artery. So in the UK, around about 2,500 on an annual basis. Um, and this, this is quite an interesting um, number, yeah? So nearly a third of strokes, between a quarter and one third of strokes, are people under the age of 50. So I have to say, I was quite shocked about this. I, I always anticipated that strokes were primarily an older person's problem, but um, the stats here clearly aren't, okay? Um, so this is, this is the important thing here. This is quite um, optimistic too. So of these 2%, only 5% of these result in death. So around about 129 a year. So, so although 20% of normal strokes are fatal, it's only 5% of those that are related to, to um, cervical arterial disease. So the proportions of fatalities associated with um, vascular problems of the neck, the result of fatalities are a lot, lot lower. They're about a quarter of the fatalities that you get in non um, uh, vertebral pathology strokes. So that's by way of background. So what does the framework have to say on the matter? So what they say is that you can go through a framework, which, you know, you'll do with every person, but it's important just to be aware of specifically looking for data within the patient's history. You need to plan the physical examination because the problem is, of course, that some tests that maybe we got taught, and certainly I got taught, might be contraindicated. Similarly, some, tr some treatment approaches may be contraindicated. So we need to be able to navigate through this uncertainty. We then need to conduct the physical examination and we need to be able to, 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 to balance um, and interpret the data from our physical examination, knowing that the examinations aren't that sensitive or are not that specific. So it still leaves us with uncertainty, okay? Um, and taking the two together, so the data from the case history and then the data from the physical examination, we need to be able to evaluate the patient's presentation. And then from that stems this bit, which is actually the most important. It's about taking the best possible decision and informing the patient. So it's what's known as shared decision-making with the patient, okay? Uh, including, including the uncertainty associated with the results from our tests. So it's important to be able to explain to the patient what's going on and, and 
allow them to make an informed choice as to whether or not they want to proceed or whether or not they want to be referred. It's not possible for us to make that that um, that call without involving the patient in the in the discussion. Okay, but the main thing is that it's it relies on our interpretation at every single one of these stages. We need to be able to judge the quality of the data and know how to interpret it. Okay, and there is a lot of uncertainty, and that's part of the problem with this. So what the framework did <clears throat> was to divide the um, the vascular pathologies of the neck into dissecting strokes, which are this lot here, versus non-dissecting non strokes. Okay. Um, and the idea really is, is there any very obvious frank vascular pathology of the neck? And these may be very subtle signs and very subtle symptoms of the underlying vascular pathologies of the neck. And we need to just be alert to these. We're going to go through the risk factors and symptoms and signs of both the dissecting and the non-dissecting shortly. So what we need to consider when we're taking our case history and when we're doing our examination is, is there any evidence of subtle signs that might indicate that there is an underlying obvious pathology of the vasculature of the neck? Okay, and the, the, the challenge for us is that we need to recognize that there isn't one single factor that is causally related to any of these problems, okay? And that there is this general consensus that there are a number of issues that together raise the index of suspicion, yeah? But I say again, there is not one particular thing that we can, we can definitely say will result in a reliable indicator that this person has a frank pathology or is at risk from having a problem with their, their um, cervical arteries during or following our osteopathic treatment. That doesn't exist, yeah? And that's very destabilizing and very anxiety provoking and that's normal for us, okay? And I, and I have no answers for you on that. I want to say that at this point, okay? <clears throat> The, the, the statement here, look for subtle signs of suspected pathology, and that's the challenge here, that the signs in a person who is, who's got some underlying vascular pathology of the neck will be subtle. They'll present with pain, they'll present with headache, but actually there may be additional, very mild symptoms that the patient may well disregard and the practitioner may start to disregard. But that's where we need to be almost hyper alert, a little bit phobic about these subtle signs to be able to look out for these. Within the case history, we need to say, look, are there any predispositions? Are there any factors here that would, again, just raise our, our index of suspicion that there may be something going on there? Okay. Um, is it winter, for example? Do they have raised blood pressure, for example? Has there been a recent trauma, for example? Okay, so these are the things that we're going to look at now, is what are some of the factors that might be related to dissecting vascular events? And then we'll look at some of the factors that might be related to non-dissecting events too, okay? So that's where we're going to next. So as I said um, previously, one of the things that we need to look out for is if there's been a dissecting event, in other words, if the, the connective tissue within the, the artery has been torn, if it's fragile, then logically um, one of the, the things that will tear it or create 
um, the risk of tearing is, is, is some form of stress, some form of trauma. And so therefore, it's of no surprise that anywhere between 40 and 64% of cases um, of dissection events will be associated with recent trauma. Okay. Um, the thing I want to, to um, highlight here is that these are frequency tables. In other words, they are simply reports in the literature of the number of people that reported it. It's not to be used as a, they're not relative risk events. So they're not odds ratios. They're not percentage chances of people having them. They are literally just retrospective reports of these are how many people presented with adverse events following manipulation, and this is what they had. Okay, so it's literally about data that is there from a retrospective analysis that may assist us as practitioners moving forward. But it's important not to use these as as weightings um, or predicting events. Okay, so I want to say that, and I'll probably repeat that a few more times. So trauma does seem to be something that's been associated with people presenting. Okay. <clears throat> they may have an underlying vascular anomaly. Um, that being the case, they may have some sort of stenosis, they may have some sort of connective tissue disorder underlying that okay smoking current or past does seem to be um associated not causal seem to be associated with people presenting with dissecting vascular events and it may be that it, it, it it's related to um effectively atherosclerosis or related to some form of change to the vessel wall okay so that's an important factor to to bear in mind is there is a history um people that have got migraine um, are also associated with vascular problems. As I said earlier, migraine is a vascular headache. So we don't quite know the underlying pathophysiology of migraine, but it seems to be um, a factor that is, uh, that is known to be associated with um, uh, serious adverse events, post manipulation. And the paradox, of course, is that people will present to osteopaths with migraine. And we do know that for the majority of migraines, osteopathic treatment does work well. You know, it, it's something that there's, there's a lot of evidence to support. Um, hypercholesterolemia, that is a, is a risk factor. So, again, probably related to um, arterial wall problems. Um, this is an interesting one, recent infection, and this might be related to the, um, the fact that it's more prevalent in winter. So um, following a, a cold or a flu incident, um, the, the, the blood tends to be somewhat thicker, um, there may be systemic inflammation, and those two things together makes the person more likely to have um, vessel wall inflammation and some sort of fragility. Um, hypertension, that's a generic thing that's associated with hypercholesterolemia. Um, oral contraception and a family history of strokes. So these, these are also other things that are noted, but they're, 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 they tend to be quite, quite low here. But the biggest thing in terms of take-home is going to be the recent trauma. So there is something that's, that's torn or has stretched the vascular wall um, that leads to a dissecting event. Okay. Um, it is important at this stage to say that, that, that we do know that we can get spontaneous um, carotid and spontaneous vertebral artery dissections, and, and unfortunately, um, there is no prediction there. Yeah, the, it's not associated with trauma. It's not associated with migraine. Um, these are these are spontaneous, as the word says, and, and, and they are they're nested within this 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 whole area which makes it very very challenging to navigate yeah so the take home is if your patient comes in with none of these yeah the fact that we have something called a spontaneous um dissection means that the absence of symptoms does not guarantee safety 
really challenging. Eh? Okay. Non-dissection vascular events. So this is this is interesting. So this is where we move away from the idea of the, the dissection being the primary cause, but a person is more prone to having a thromboembolism that's related to the vasculature of the neck. And here we see much more systemic or, or generic um, risk factors. So again, smoking, we're right up there, yeah? Anywhere between 60 to 75%, three quarters of people are, again, current or past smokers. So the past smokers, are really, really important too. So the only ones that we are, if you like, happiest with are never smokers. Raised blood pressure, we know this. Hypercholesterolemia, again, we know this. And here again, the migraine and the vascular anomalies and the family histories and the oral contraceptives and the recent infections. And there we go, mild trauma, okay? So we see here that the the, um, the role of trauma is still there, but it's it's reversed compared with the dissecting events. With the dissecting events that we saw previously, let me quickly go back there, it's trauma. It's the top thing, yeah, up to 60%. But with the non-dissecting events, it's actually the lowest risk. It's the lowest event, all right? And it's the, it's the systemic lifestyle problems that are actually raising raising the, the frequency here okay dissecting event symptoms and again by now you would have seen um unsurprisingly headaches and neck pain okay um headache being 80 percent of people presented with it um, and up to 80% of people presented with neck pain in those that ended up having a serious adverse event. Okay. And then under half, so this is the minority, technically speaking, uh, of patients also had these symptoms. So visual disturbances, um, change the sensation in the upper limb, dizziness, change the sensation in the face, change the sensation in the lower limb. Okay. So the frank neurological symptoms in the periphery um, associated with, with, with loss of function, um, be they cranial nerves or peripheral nerves, were, were around about 30%, yeah? So, so not maybe as strong as one would expect. And the pre predominant symptom um, is that which is related to neck pain and headache, again. If you split the dissecting events into those that are vertebral artery versus the dissecting events associated with the internal carotid, we can kind of unpick that a little bit. Okay, so we're, we're doing a, a deeper dive now into dissecting events and splitting them apart, if you'll pardon my poor joke. Um, in VBA, vertebral, vertebral basilar artery dissections um, tends to affect the brainstem, um, unsteadiness and ataxia, dysarthria, aphasia. So these are, if you'll remember um, from my previous lecture, we talked about the five Ds and the three Ns. This is what this is trying to look for, yeah? Weakness in the lower limbs, weakness in the upper limbs, difficulty swallowing, nausea and vomiting, facial palsy, and here's the Horner syndrome, ptosis, okay? Around about 19%. And then we've got very, very obvious things like loss of consciousness, confusion, and drowsiness, okay? But in terms of um, more than 50%, it's unsteadiness. So when it comes to our physical examination, which we'll talk about later on, it is really, really important that we take account with observation how steady our patient seems to be as they walk into the practice, as we escort them into our, into our room, um, how they how they move spatially when they're sitting, when they're gesturing, when they're reaching for things. You know what's that like? And and those are the subtle symptoms that we talked about earlier. They're not ragingly positive. They're they're very subtle changes to locomotion, coordination, and balance. Okay, with in somebody that comes in typically with a headache slash neck pain presentation, we're looking for gait problems 
or ataxic changes. Internal carotid. This is really interesting. So the internal carotid, which is the, the rarer of the two, ptosis, where the, where the, the eye sort of is, uh, the eyelid is, is, is changed, okay? This is one of the biggest um, symptoms that are presented. Again, nearly 80%, up to 80% of people had some form of ptosis, okay? Um, and then we had the upper limb weakness, we had the facial palsies, and we had the lower limb problems. And then the five Gs and three Ns, dysphagia, dysarthria, aphasia, and then the ataxia. And then from there onwards, we've got the things like nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, loss of consciousness, confusion, and dysphagia. Okay, so certainly what we're looking at is, is these ones in particular. Yeah. Um, so again, unsteadiness, look for the way that they're moving in your practice room. Listen to the way that they're talking and expressing themselves. Yeah. Look at their face. Is there any evidence of slight changes to, and it may not be a full hornus. Yeah. It may well be just a, an eyelid that's slightly drooping, um, that they, they, there's a slight asymmetry to the face. They're very, very subtle uh, signs that if you're not looking for them, you may miss. Okay. So that's the dissections, and we've split them into um, vertebral basilar artery and internal carotid artery. And now we're going to look at the um, the symptoms commonly associated with non-dissecting events. Yeah, that that second that second group. Um, just one little thing to say with the ptosis is it's not. Remember, I said it's not necessarily a classic Horner's syndrome. So with a classic Horner's syndrome. Um, you're also going to change the uh, the ability for the person to sweat. Um, and without going too deeply into it, and it's not my area of expertise, my understanding is that with Horner syndrome, it's it's effect, it depends on whether it affects the first, second or third neuron that supplies the, 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 the head and the eye. Um, and the ptosis that's associated with the internal carotid artery doesn't affect the, the facial sweating. OK, so um, don't look for a classic Horner's. What you're looking for generically is more to do with the, the control of the eyelid. So it's, it's, it's an isolated ptosis that is similar to Horner's syndrome. <clears throat> but don't expect to get the, the, the classic symptoms and signs of a full blown Horner's syndrome. So non dissecting events. <clears throat> so again, what we tend to get here is headaches okay nearly 50 percent of people will present with headaches and then we have the, the sort of the classic stroke signs of <clears throat> paresthesia in the upper and the lower limbs visual disturbances facial paresthesia perhaps some neck pain but actually that's relatively low perhaps some dizziness but again that's relatively low so the main thing here is it's it's it's, it's to do with headache and then broad, non-specific changes to sensation in the upper and the lower limbs. Yeah, so again, very, very subtle signs. And this is why when we go on to looking for our examination, it's really, really important to watch them closely to see what's going on, okay? <laughs> We're looking for very, very subtle changes in, in, in their gait. We're looking to see their balance. And we're looking to see whether there's any evidence of hyperreflexia. So we're looking for ev any evidence of, of upper motor neuron signs. So hyperreflexia, um, altered um, reflex testing, um, Babinski's being changed. Um, we're looking for, you know, positive Froman sign, for example, uh, maybe presence of clonus. All of these sorts of things are what we're looking for, okay? Um, cranial nerve examination, just a very, very brief one, but particularly focusing in on um, eye tracking, 
um, looking specifically at facial function. So we're looking at the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve, muscles of mastication, chewing, um, deviation of the tongue, looking for the arches, um, and also ch checking to make sure that the facial sensation um, and muscles of expression, you know, wrinkling the eyebrow, puffing out their cheeks, all of the things that you do for cranial nerve testing, um, all of those are present. Okay, and then the, the last thing to do uh, or to consider doing is checking for upper cervical instability. And this goes back to our hypothesis of looking for um, connective tissue problems. Yeah, so this will be people, for example, that have got trisomy 21 um, Down syndrome effectively, or people that have got hyperflexibility syndrome, um, Ella Danlos. Um, or chronic hyperflexibility, those people that have got upper cervical instability, the indication then is that they may also have fragility of the, um, the, the, the neck vasculature. Um, so if you've got evidence of instability, then think, are they at risk of um, having trouble with their, their, their cervical arteries? Okay. So, Sophia, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I wonder whether at this stage we've been going for probably about an hour and a bit. Did you want to give everybody a little bit of a break? It's up to you, Devon. So you yeah. are the boss. <laughs> okay. So, let's, so if you let's, want a break, let's, just um, let us know how long. Mm -hmm. Let's have a five minute break, because what I want to go on to now is just to sort of talk through um, some, some typical case histories of people that might come in. So we've got three cases to to discuss, and then we can talk a little bit more after that um, about uh, examination and, and treatment. Okay, okay, so five minute break. Okay. So we'll have Next a minute break. Да, через, после перерыва у Девана три, три истории болезни пройдется по ним. Поэтому отдыхаем пять минут, возвращаемся через пять минут. Um, if there are any questions, um, if anyone's understood what I've been saying, then then please uh, obviously um, put them in the chat or, or speak to Sophia. Devon, hello. Hello, is that Dennis? I have yes, yes, yes. Hi, I Dennis. have a couple of questions, but maybe let's do it after the end. Um, is it questions on what we've covered so far? Okay, I have one. What does it mean, upper cervical instability? What do what's you mean my opinion? Term? Or what is the test? What's, what, what's the test or what does it mean? Okay, so there are a couple of tests that we can do. And um, I'm hoping to show you at the end, I'll, I'll demonstrate them on, on my partner. Um, there are a couple of tests that you can do to assess the mobility of the upper cervical spine, um, which we can do to see if there's any evidence of, of, of instability. Okay, clear. Yeah. And I, I have another question. In sure. your own practice, yes. how often do you perform adjustments for the neck? Huh. Um, so if it's people that are coming in with headache and neck pain, presumably, uh -huh. I, I have to say that I am, over the years, I'm reducing the number of manipulations that I do. So you prefer mobilization? No, I'm, I'm also reducing those two. So, so the important thing to say here um, is that the, the, the predisposition to vascular problems of the neck um, means that it's not just manipulation that's the problem. Um, it's often associated with mobilizations um, and even exercise. So rotation uh, and, 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 and forcible mo mobilization in rotation would be just as potentially a problem if the vascular supply is, is compromised. So it's, it, although we've talked about cervical manipulation, the manipulation involves the rotation and we'll talk a little bit later on, but um, I think mobilizations are also potentially still as dangerous. Okay, clear. Uh, okay. What about investigations? Yeah. MRI, for example. So again, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end um, in okay, terms of the okay. gold standards for, for assessing these things. Okay, good. Okay? Let's have a break. Yeah. All right, let's have a break. 
Um, so we'll say um, about seven minutes, if that's okay, and I'll be back shortly. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So it's uh, blah, 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 by quarter past, 15 minutes past, yeah? Yes. Oh, Sophia, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sorry. <laughs> a bit right, I was no looking for my phone. Yeah, we can continue. <laughs> Any news from Tatiana? Uh, she is sitting and waiting for answer from the internet operator. Nothing, nothing uh, changes. You know, we have so such a massive snowing today, and in her region as well. So it, this is also not good for the you know Wi-Fi things and so on. So it, maybe no comparison, but we've even got I've even got snow outside here at the moment. <laughs> okay. Okay, so should we start again, carry on? Yep. So I've got three typical case histories um, that have been extracted from the literature. So these are these are things that actually happened. Um, and th there's some interesting points within that that I'm gonna I'm gonna bring out for you um, as we talk through it. Um, and here comes my coffee. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so let's make a move. So we've got a 46 year old supermarket worker um, and she comes in complaining of um, headache uh, and neck pain. Um, and she described it as as unusual. So that's 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 one of the things to to be aware of. Um, and that's something that is a is a. Um, a feature that people often describe. So, as we said earlier with the with the figures, um, headaches are everyone suffers with them. I, I would be very very surprised if if you come across somebody that's never had a headache, um, and people are kind of used to them. So, what we're looking for here is this this idea that I've got a headache and it's different. Yeah. Um, so it's it's unusual, or it's a, it, it, sometimes they say that it's like a headache that I've never had before. Yeah, so it, it's that's a feature that should be a a, a red flag, effectively. Okay, um, they'd had a, um, a a minor road traffic accident um, about a week previously, um, and that the symptoms of headache and neck pain had come on subsequent to that. So again, you know, this is typical. This is almost like a, a grade two whiplash associated disorder um, where there is a, a bit of neck pain and stiffness um, that's increasing after, after the car accident, which is what you expect as the inflammation increases. Um, so, it, you know, it's unusual because you've had a car accident. It, it, it stands to reason. Um, symptoms are getting worse. In the past medical history, she's got hypertension, so she's got raised blood pressure. She's got also, she's on statins, so she's got raised um, blood cholesterol levels as well. Um, and in her family history, um, her mother had a, a myocardial infarct as a, as a history. So we know that there is, there's something, there's something um, cardiovascular-ish in her immediate history in terms of her medication management, but also in the family history. So these are all factors that um, would raise our index of suspicion, okay? Um, when we did our examination, we find there is a reduction in cranial nerves eight, nine, and 10. So she had slight changes to her hearing. Um, there was a little bit of uh, loss of, 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 of hearing on one side. Um, 
her swallowing and her speaking was slightly hoarse. Um, she felt a little bit sick. Um, her shoulder and neck movement was a bit restricted, but again, she came in post RTA. Her blood pressure was a little bit high. And she had a number of other symptoms as well. She felt sick. Um, as I said, her, her voice is a little bit hoarse and she complains of being dizzy and nauseous. Okay, so these are some of the, the subtle changes that are in the background um, that it's important to pick up upon. Yeah, so these aren't what you typically expect with a, a traditional grade two whiplash associated disorder. There are something else that's in there. But the problem, of course, is that, you know, if you've had a car accident, and I certainly have if I've had a car accident, you do feel a little bit sick. You, you know, when the head goes back, you might get a little bit of laryngeal strain and you might feel a bit dizzy. Um, so all of these could very easily be explained by physical trauma to the muscular skeletal structures, yeah? Um, and we may not be thinking this is a vascular structure that's also been affected, okay? Um, in this particular case, they don't say what happened, but whether or not the person was treated, but two days later, they represent there's increased nausea. They're now getting um, problems with their balance, so their gait's being affected, and they're having overt difficulties now swallowing and speaking, okay? so these indicate a, um, a, a, a trajectory of worsening symptoms that are now becoming much, much more um, brainstem related. Um, and of course, even now raise further the incidence of suspicion that there may be something going on that's, that's beyond just plain straightforward musculoskeletal problems. Okay, so effectively, there's a typical background for vascular risk factors with classic distribution for vertebral artery somatic pain, which is worsening. Okay, so there's the trauma, there's high blood pressure, there's hypercholesterolemia, there's a history of MI in the family. Um, she's got neck pain, she's starting to get trouble with walking and movement, she has uh, difficulty swallowing, and there's changes to her voice, and it's worsening. Okay, so these are all things that that we should be um, hyper alert to. Okay, in terms of our examination, um, high blood pressure and evidence of cranial nerve dysfunction are suggestive of cervical vascular problems, and post trauma. A couple of days later. She's now starting to get um, brainstem effects as well. So these again indicate our problems. Okay. Um, and most of all, the trauma was post RCA. What do we do with this person? Well, in an ideal world, we would we would um, recommend that they go on for onward um, examination. The gold standard is, is an MRI. With, although it's actually magnetic res resonance and geography. So it's, it's traditionally MRA, but it is um, an MRI basis, um, magnetic resonance imaging using um, a special injection to actually highlight the vasculature. So that would be the gold standard test to look for um, evidence of changes to the vascular supply within the brain, brain stem, and um, cervical arteries. Okay, let's have a look at another case. Case two. Um, your friend presents with neck pain and unremitting headaches that's not relieved by paracetamol or ibuprofen. Okay. Um, they think that they've got a bit of a neck problem, that the neck's gone out. Um, and what they want you to do is to give it a click, quick click, which you've probably done many times in the past, just to get their neck working again and to put the you know the vertebra that's out to put it back in which is very a very common sort of perception of, of how manipulation works <clears throat> they, they've had a headache it's been there for three or four days and, and actually the trajectory is that it's now uh, worsening it's becoming much much more uh, problem uh, and you can see from this this um 
presentation that it, it seems to be mechanical yeah um and your 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 um position may well be um yeah okay I've had a headache um taking paracetamol it's not really worked um so yeah let's let's uh let's 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 do a manipulation to relieve your head your your friend's neck pain and headache that will be that'll be a fairly understandable response um and the problem here of course is that you may not then do a full case history because you've almost biased yourself into thinking this is what the problem is okay um in this particular case the physical therapist goes ahead and does manipulate the neck so these are real cases they, they did do that they did click the neck um and then the person starts to experience numbness and paralysis into their left arm and their left hand okay and ended up being admitted to casualty department now you may say well okay this is quite rare but but the reality is i i also know of a case um that took place uh, in russia curiously um of of a, of a of an osteopathic practitioner who did exactly that they had um uh, an, an unusual a case of neck pain and headache um went to see an osteopathic colleague um and the osteopathic colleague did some treatment um they they said oh look it's just a, a an upper cervical problem they did the treatment and the symptoms got worse um the difference was that this person who whose symptoms got worse didn't end up um having to go to hospital but they started to diff to, to 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 generate cranial nerve dysfunction okay um so so this does happen yeah um and it's understandable because the vascular problems are masquerading as typical neck pain and headaches and that that is the the scary thing yeah for me and it should be a scary thing for you too final case this is a, an accountant that has a five-day history of one-sided neck pain and jaw pain as well as a, a sort of a headache over the sort of the, the temporal region um, on the same side um, again this has come on following uh, a road traffic accident um, and they have what you would expect which is a, a reduced motion in their cervical spine the therapist assesses their range of motion and and it's restricted and it's painful um and the therapist advises that they start doing some range of motion exercises okay so diagnosis um would have been again a grade two whiplash associated disorder um and they didn't manipulate here they just started doing some mobilizations um, advises the patients to start doing some gentle exercises to increase the range of motion um, and again a, a relatively straightforward and um, appropriate reasonable management um, patient then represents the next day pain is worse now has the drooping of the eyelid um, on one side and their blood pressure has raised quite dramatically okay um and what they did then quite rightly was to refer them on for imaging um and what they found on imaging was that there was um a dissection event that had taken place within the internal carotid artery um and they the the, the, the symptoms were effectively from an ongoing dissection event that was missed because it looked like it was a simple, straightforward grade two whiplash associated disorder. Okay. Um, the, the main thing here is that there were no other factors that would raise your degree of suspicion other than the fact that it was come on after a road traffic accident. Yeah. Um, other than that, everything else was, was negative. And that goes to my point that I made earlier, which is just because you don't have those symptoms doesn't mean that you can rule out a dissecting event and it's it's really really difficult yeah there may be spontaneous events that have no risk factors they're utterly unpredictable and they will just explode 
um, when you are when you're managing them. Okay, so in a way, um, I'm I'm sure that you're understanding that that this lecture is probably raising more questions than perhaps is answering, and, and, and that's true because in fact there aren't really that many answers. So I, I suppose I want to deliberately make you more concerned and more anxious because it means that you're more likely then to be alert for these things yeah and that there isn't a predictable guaranteed um reliable way of making the decision you are dealing with uncertainty and that's the fact So with all of this in the background, how do we plan for treatment? We just say, sorry, we're not going to treat you. Well, you, you could do that. But of course, remember that the, the frequency of these events are very, very rare. OK, so so there's always going to be this difficult risk benefit ratio that we have to that seesaw, that balance that we have to we have to reach. OK, so in terms of just, if you like, global advice that I would give you is that you need to generate hypotheses. OK, one of the things that I am aware of is um, and, and maybe this doesn't doesn't occur in, 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 in Russia, but certainly sometimes in the, in the UK. Um, my undergraduate students are very. They, they seem to think that their examination will reveal to them answers that their case history doesn't. So, so they, they, they tend to rely on the results of their manual examination, their palpation, their range of motion testing, their clinical testing. Um, and, and it's really, really important to understand that, that this is false reassurance, that we know that the best thing that you can do is to take a very, very good case history. And at that point, generate your clinical hypotheses and then from there design uh, an appropriate clinical examination to rule in or rule out the hypotheses that you are considering okay so hypothesis generation is fundamental and underpins your safe management of these types of conditions okay things that you need to consider you know are there any precautions that you need to be aware of before you do any osteopathic manipulations? Are there any contraindications to osteopathic manipulative treatment? What tests are you going to include or even exclude because you may feel that they are risky? Because even with a test, the majority of our tests, if you think about them, um, are provocative. They're designed to stress an area in order to generate a result and when they do generate the result and go oh that area is being stressed it's vulnerable but of course do you want to do you want to deliberately provoke a dissecting event do you deliberately want to stretch that to see whether it increases the pain well of course you don't because it carries a risk so it's important to understand that even an examination will carry a risk associated with it it will it will carry a benefit, but it also carries a risk. And it's about that uncertainty um, when you are designing your investigations, your examination routine with that particular patient as to how you manage this. What's the priority? How do we make decisions about what to do, what not to do? How do we how do we engage the patient? How do we inform the patient about what we're considering, uh, what we're considering, um, and and how do we order our examination, and and do we have to adopt the way that we do our tests in order to make sure that we minimise risks and maximise the benefits? So these are all things that that we need to think about prior to not only planning treatment but also planning our examination. Okay, so the guide. Uh, the, the framework <clears throat> has come up with this um, algorithm here, 
Um, and they've made two points here, which I want to, to, to highlight. First of all, no single test alone will provide decision-making information. So you can't rely on a single gold standard test. It doesn't exist, okay? The other interesting thing is that positional testing is unlikely to influence decision-making. So you won't be able to get anything just by doing positional testing, all right? The most important thing is clinical suspicion of vascular causes is supported by reasoned historical and or clinical examination findings. And if anything flags up at that point, your, your route to management is to refer for further investigations, vascular investigations. OK, if there's nothing that flags up, then the next question is, well, are there any precautions or actual contraindications to physical examination? And if the answer is no, then you can go on to do your physical examination. And the areas that by now you would have expected is a neurological examination. And that includes both the cranial and the peripheral exam the nerve examination. Okay, so those are going to be key components if you suspect any form of vascular pathologies of the neck. You're also going to be looking for long tract slash upper motor neuron signs. So you're going to be looking at person's coordination and their gait, even though they're presenting with neck pain and headache. You're going to check their blood pressure, okay, routinely, and you're looking for any evidence of raised blood pressure that, that's raised beyond the norm for them. Um, and you could even do some auscultation. We'll talk about sites where we can auscultate um, later on after I've done the lecture. Now, I do remember... Um, doing a, um, a lecture with some Russian students. Um, I can't remember when it was, but it was several years ago. And I did a quick show of hands. I said, look, look how many people here um, routinely take blood pressure when they're looking at an osteopathic patient? Um, and in fact, I think it was a class of about 20 people and, and, and only one person did it. Um, so I was going to, with my translator, say, look, how many people here in, in this seminar routinely take blood pressure of their patients um, and I was going to get you guys to put your hands up but obviously I can't do that but you'll know whether or not you do uh, and I would I would strongly advise that if you are a person that doesn't check routinely blood pressure that you start doing it okay because it will be one of the things that will give you an idea of whether there is any generic underlying vascular cardiovascular problem or if you know that they haven't had it and it is elevated, then it might indicate something that is ongoing at this time. Okay. So either way, from you, it's a it's a win-win situation. Check their blood pressure. It's it's a cheap machine, it's easy to do, it gives you a lot of very good information. Um, and even if they have no evidence of a, a vascular problem, if they've got raised blood pressure, they will be likely uh, to have an increased risk of a number of, of, of um, morbidities, strokes being one of them. So, you know, just in terms of lifestyle advice and, and, and good practice, I think measuring blood pressure is, is vital. Okay. Um, so it could give information about risk, but also it could give history, um, a sign of a, a stroke, for, for example, case history of uh, case history three that we talked about earlier with the accountant. Um, the other interesting thing is that there is a scaled risk. In other words, if a person is hypertensive, there are degrees of hypertension that are worrying. So for example, you know, somebody who's got a blood pressure of 190 over 100, definitely hypertensive, but so is somebody who's 160 over 95. However, this person is more at risk than this person. So the higher the hypertension, the higher the risk too. So it's no good just saying, are you normal tensive or hypertensive? It's actually the degrees of hypertension that are also very informative for us as clinicians. Okay, so it's, it's important to capture these data as well. However, remember, as I said, that in those people that are young, that are likely to have spontaneous um, dissections of the, of the cervical arteries, blood pressure is generally not a factor. But as I said, the lack of factors doesn't mean that you're safe because there's this, this horrible idea of, of, of spontaneous um, 
dissections. Okay, so this is the uncertainty. Even if they're negative, they're still potentially at risk, and you have to still potentially be cautious. So with a neurological examination, what is it that, <clears throat> that we need to do? Well, as we've already alluded, um, it is important to conduct a good peripheral nerve examination. Now that would include checking myotomes, dermatomes, and deep tendon reflexes of the upper and the lower limbs, and look for evidence of um, clonus, um, abnormal muscle tone, and for any upper motor neuron problems. Okay, so that's important to be able to do. So it's not just mitomes and dermatomes. We're looking for evidence of, of, of upper, neuro, upper motor neuron problems as well. Okay, um, it involves doing a cranial nerve screen too. So anybody with neck pain uh, and also presenting with a headache, these are the things that you want to do. Peripheral nerves, upper and lower extremities, upper motor neuron signs, um, upper and lower extremities, and cranial nerves. Okay, um, and then we can do some auscultation of the carotid artery. We can also potentially um, auscultate near the vertebral artery. And again, I'll be I'll be um, showing you that um, on my partner as a model at the end of today. Okay. Um, anything else to say on this? I suppose the only thing really to say uh, to finish off with this lot is that the results that you get from these are need to be interpreted with the knowledge that none of these are 100% sensitive, none of these are 100% specific, so the reliability isn't going to be as much as maybe you would like. And even if they were, because of this whole phenomenon of spontaneous dissections occurring in a younger population, even if all of these tests were 100% reliable and they were all negative, <laughs> you still can't rule it out. Okay, you still have to proceed cautiously. So this is the uncertainty that we're dealing with in this case, all right, or in these cases. What do we do? Well, we need to onward really referral. And, and, and here's a, another interesting lack of direction for us um, in the Western world. And I'd be curious to know um, from you guys what, what they do in Russia, but certainly in, 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 in the UK and the US, there are no clinical guidelines that have been published that, that highlight um, medical diagnostic workups for suspected um, cranio or, or sorry, um, vascular pathologies of the neck. Okay, so the advice really is that we, or you, work out what the local referral pathways are for referrals. Okay, um, and there are three modalities that you can use for um, assessing imaging, uh, good imaging for um, vertebral artery and also carotid artery health. Um, and these are duplex ultrasound, um, magnetic resonance angiography. So that's MRI with a, with a, a, um, a, a dye that's injected to, to highlight the vasculature. Uh, and then finally, um, CT scanning. OK, so they're all highly technical. This one is the one that maybe is the quickest to access, but it's got issues with um, degrees of damage that need to be there before it can pick it up. So these definitely are the gold standard. OK, but they're expensive. Um, and as you as we'll see in just a moment, because the the incidences are quite rare, there's this cost benefit um, uh, discussion that has to be had as well. OK, so if a person's got, having done all your examination, if you think that they are at low risk or there is no index of suspicion, how do you proceed? OK, so a person presents with a very common condition, which is neck pain with or without head pain. You've been through your detailed case history 
in which you hold in your mind the possibility of those very subtle signs and those risk factors that are associated with it, and you have excluded those to the best of your ability. You then conducted um, a shared decision-making process, so you've engaged the, um, the, 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 the patient with the explanation of your decision-making process, and you have considered their suitability for osteopathic manipulative therapy, and you've considered the alternative or the non-OMT treatment um, possibility as well. And so this is the absolute risk. You know, the absolute risk, we're talking about one six thousandth of a percent um, in terms of the risk of manipulation causing death. Yeah, so there is a really serious problem, but it's 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 relatively rare, um, and 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 that's the risk. Yeah, but on the other side, we do also know that there is a moderate to a large effect that osteopathic manipulative therapy really does improve pain. It reduces disability and it improves all functional outcomes across cervical radiculopathy, tension type headaches, migraines cervicogenic headaches okay uh, and exercise on top of that has benefits as well so this is the this is the the arena that we're dealing with you know there is a very 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 low risk of a disastrous effect but it is there it's not it's not it's not absent it, it, it can remain there and yet the treatment can provide lots and lots of benefits too and and, and that's the 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 paradox i suppose with um managing these people okay and not that this is an excuse or not that this is um a reason to perform osteopathic manipulative or orthopedic manipulative therapy but it's, it's sometimes worthwhile just as part of the discussion with the patient to talk about the risks associated with alternative treatments so we can hear non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, the risks, the absolute risks are between you know 5.9 to 6.6 percent of having an MI associated with a heart attack have associated with taking it. There's also a reasonable risk and nearly half a percent of getting a gastrointestinal excuse me, bleed. Um, COX-2 inhibitors. Again, this is actually quite high. This is one of the reasons that in the West, um, we have stopped advising people to take COX-2 inhibitors um, because there was discovered to be a, a higher um, um, risk of myocardial infarct compared with standard non-steroidals. Um, even with aspirin, um, there is possibility of, of bleeding um, and paracetamol between the five and six percent, this, this this surprised me of myocardial infarct um, and renal and gastrointestinal problems. Again, there is issues there. And if we contrast that with OMT, you know that's the absolute risk there, a thousand, a six thousandth of percent, and the baseline prevalence is 0.79 compared with all of these. So, you know, these are based on UK data um they're not international but these are the comparative risks that you can quite rightly present as part of your shared decision making um with patients so in summary the rate of vertebral artery dissections in the general population is estimated between 0.75 to 2.9 per 100,000 OK, so this is in the general population and it's not associated with OMT. The best available data that we've got in terms of vertebral artery dissections associated with OMT is, is between 0.4, in other words, below here, up to 5.1, which is above here. OK, so... <laughs> <laughs> the confidence intervals in the best data that we have is either lower than the general population or higher than the general population. Uh, uh, and that means 
that that it's very difficult for us yeah the 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 risks are between 0.14 and 6.66 and they're so broad that what it means is that that there's probably a fundamental problem with the defining of cases and the identification of cases the retrospective nature of this means that our data is unreliable okay um because if you if you really looked at these data what we're saying here is that by going to an osteopath you reduced your risk of having vertebral artery dissection i mean that's clearly ridiculous because there's nothing that we're going to do that's going to reduce it but that's what the data technically shows all right and that's the problem with it is that it's 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 very difficult to judge the quality of the data of rare events associated with with manipulation all right so how do we breach this and how do we have this discussion with with patients how do we do this so you know what what's really important at the moment in the west is that we talk about the importance of allowing patients to take a play a, a key role in deciding what's best for them yeah and so you know whilst we are the ones that evaluate the risks we talk about the alternatives we discuss the uncertainty it's really really important to understand how the patients understood their problem and what matters to them and what the context of it is okay and it's important that they are involved with making the decisions you know do you get their consent are they involved in the treatment planning are they involved with the um the onward referral process if that's what's required okay so the guidelines is is, is helping is, is helping us to be aspirational in that we use an evidence-based approach that is patient-centered okay and that we use a shared decision-making model in order to do this all right so these are aspirational goals and there's this notion of share which in 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 english is to is to be able to 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 um work in partnership with a person and they're using it as a mnemonic so s is to seek patient participation h is to help patients explore and compare options and then a is to assess patients values and, and, and preferences the r is to re reach a decision with the patient and e is then to actually talk about whether that decision seems to make sense for them um, but also seems to make sense from the perspective of um, the evidence that's out there and if not to highlight that and have a discussion about that uncertainty okay now Dennis asked me a question with regards to you know do I what do I do with these people um and and, um, and how often do I manipulate um my patients next and and what's my position with mobilizations and those are really valid questions um and and what we do know from the framework is that it's 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 important really to to work in a way that is minimally invasive so so the you'll you'll see from two of those case histories that the the patients presented following trauma and the trauma was road traffic accident but equally the trauma could be the manipulation yeah Remember that although we are stating that probably people are presenting with an ongoing dissection event that is missed by the practitioner, there is also the possibility, an alternate explanation is that in fact, the manipulation was the trauma that caused the dissecting event. So of course, it's super, super important in those people that are at risk that our treatment isn't the the, the 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 traumatic event that tears the the um the the vessels all right so it's important to keep our forces to the minimal and that's not just for um hvt it's also for mobilization okay um and it's most importantly also to do with examination so when you get a person to look over their um, left shoulder look over their right shoulder and look up to the ceiling which are all very standard um, examination processes that it's really really important that we understand that these two 
will be putting stress through the blood vessels um, in many different directions. And that in itself, if you've got a fragile blood vessel wall, yeah, could increase the risk and could be the trauma that sets the uh, the events cascading and starting. Okay. Um, cervical manipulations, you, I'm sure you've had cervical manipulations performed upon you by students. Um, some of them hurt, yeah? Some of them are awkward. Some of them feel like a real strain. Some of them you get a little bit worried about. Um, so it's very, very important that, that, that your technical ability to generate HVTs in the cervical spine, if that's what you both choose, patient and practitioner choose to do, that they are comfortable. Because if they're uncomfortable, it means that probably your, your technical competence is a bit crude, and that means that there is a risk of um, straining tissues, including vascular tissues. Okay? And if I've scared you all beyond the realms of ever wanting to do any form of cervical manipulation or mobilization or testing ever again, um, thoracic manipulations, good old-fashioned dogs um, which have nothing to do with the neck have been shown to be clinically effective for dealing with neck pain and headaches okay so i suppose as, as a secondary answer to to dennis's question <clears throat> what i am finding myself doing is is much less cervical mobilization and much less cervical manipulation but doing more thoracic mobilization and thoracic manipulation and also do much more acupuncture needling um, which has also been shown to be particularly good for for, for, for um, uh, headaches and chronic pain chronic neck pain than I am doing the the traditional mobilizations and manipulations of the of the cervical spine I think We're there. Excellent. So, any questions at all, people? Is anybody out there? Looks like no questions. Silence again. <laughs> oh, good. It's very weird not having any 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 hearing when I'm, I'm lecturing like this. Very very strange. At the um, moment, I don't have any questions, Devon. So okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, so one of the things that changed, um, and again, I did already highlight this in my previous lecture, is that there are a number of tests that have classically been taught, and I I was taught this um, for testing or screening for um, manipulation tests. Yeah. Um, and they're known as arterial tests, declines tests, uh, mains tests. There's a number of different names for them. Um, Hallpike test, Hotant's test, Underberg's test. Um, and, and in the first 2012 iteration of the framework, it did suggest that we do these tests. Uh, and, 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 and it's like, no, we don't do these now. Because, of course, if the person's coming with uh, fragility to the blood vessels or an early dissecting event taking place and they're presenting with neck pain or headaches, if you do these tests, you are further worsening the problem. So the pre-manipulative, traditional pre-manipulative pre vertebral artery testing is, is now not advised at all. Okay. Um, any questions? No questions here. Okay, cool. Um, so what I want to do very briefly is just to, I'll, I'll call my partner up and um, talk to you about the upper cervical um, instability test that you can do. But again, a little bit like the, um, the cranial artery test that I've just shown you, these are designed to provoke or test for instability. So they, they they run the risk of putting stress through the tissue. So it's important to weigh up the, the, the benefits, but the risks also of doing these, the, these tests. Um, so I'll show you the, the two um, um, 
instability tests that you, you may be able to do if you felt it was appropriate, and also the sites that we can we can use if we wish to auscultate um, for the, uh, the, the carotid artery um, and also for the vertebral artery. Um, and what we're looking for here is any evidence of um, a brewery or a, 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 a flow disturbance that we might be able to, to listen for, um, which may indicate that there is some form of narrowing or change to the flow within the, the artery. Okay, so if you can give me um, five minutes, uh, I'm going to turn the screen off, I'll, I'll, I'll get my couch set up and I'll get my partner up and then we'll, we'll reconfigure. Um, what I'm going to have to do um, Can you can you hear me okay, Sophia? Yes, I can hear. Okay, so um, I'm I'm going to have to move away, and, and I'll use a different camera. But it, um, if yeah, we it. if we can't hear it, then I'm going to have to I'll have to join with my phone, and we'll use that for the audio. But we'll see what it's like, eh? Yeah, I remember last time we did it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop the share. And um, I'm going to turn off my video and, and audio and I'll just give me about five minutes. So if we come back at five past, then I'll hopefully be able to um, just run through a quick practical. And if you've got any questions on techniques or practicals, then is the time to ask me. OK. Mm -hmm. Dennis, would you mind just translating that? If the, if the guys have got any questions, practical questions, then to, um, to, 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 to ask me when I do that. Please, that's great. Cool. So, uh, sorry, I'm a bit busy with my daughter, so I'm trying oh. to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try to translate if possible. Okay. No, well, no, just just ask them if they've got any questions, practical questions to to, to ask Sophia. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, Sophia, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, so guys, um, this is my uh, other half, Annette. <clears throat> um, so what I'm going to show you is, first of all, um, a couple of tests that I can do for, or you can do for upper, upper um, cervical spine instability. So this is the one that you need to consider 
the risks and benefits because of course if you've got a dissecting event in progress um then you want to do these cautiously or maybe not even consider doing them so the i'm not suggesting at all that you must do these but these are tests that you could do um but you need to weigh up the risks and benefits of the patients in front of you okay should you choose to do it what you need to do and and this is going to be maybe difficult to, sh to show you but you want to put your finger let your head, let your head drop back you need to put your fingertip on the spinous process of c2 and with your fingertip on either side of C2, so I'm kind of there and there on, on, on either side of C2, I then simply start to very, very slowly side bend the head to the left and to the right. Now, this technique works because the alar ligaments and the transverse ligament very tightly binds um, C1 and C2 together. And by inducing a side bending, you will get an immediate motion coupling where the, the SB of C2, so as I side bend Annette's head to the left, the SB of C2 will rotate to the right hand side. So I will feel in my fingertip. Um, so if I'm fingertip is there, as I side bend Annette's head to the left, I feel the SB do this. So it moves. Oh, let me show you this way. There we go. <clears throat> so my fingertip S2 SP is, is located there. I'm side bending and it's head to the to the left hand side and it rotates. And if I side bend ahead to the other side, it rotates in the other direction. So I will feel the spinous process of C2 rotating left and right as I side bend left and right. And if that happens, then it tells me that the upper cervical ligaments are working well which implies that the ligamentous structures are intact um, and therefore gives us an indication that the connected tissue of the neck is intact as well all right the other technique that is traditionally shown is known as sharps purses test um, and i don't like this one because this is much much more provocative because again, if, and this is for the transverse ligament, if the transverse ligament is not intact, then when we're putting pressure through the forehead, effectively we're, we're, we're testing for the beginnings of subluxation. Uh, and the, the symptoms are then um, a, a dural pain because we're impinging the dura. Okay, so the test traditionally is done with you holding um, the lateral masses of C3 and pushing down whilst nodding the head. So you're, you're applying compression and nodding through the head and you're feeling for a translation, a sliding forward of the um, C3 lateral masses and the patient experiencing, remember, a provocation of symptoms, okay? Um, and this is this is a provocative test highly provocative test and it it's testing the movement of your dens against the spinal cord and that's why i don't like it because if there is any form of disruption you're deliberately bouncing the dens off of the spinal cord and it's not something that, that personally I, I i'm happy with so i tend not to do this as a technique okay now in terms of auscultation What we're looking to do for the carotids is you've got the carotid bifurcation located in here where you palpate. So you need to come in, get a gentle palpation, and then you place your stethoscope in this region here at the bifurcation and slightly higher up in there so that you're on the internal carotid and you're listening for any, any brewy. Um, so you're feeling you're listening for a shh, 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 which indicates that there is turbulence, the blood flow, um, normally in the arteries. 
um, you should have laminar flow, which means that the flow is very smooth, it's not disturbed, and you won't hear, hear anything. This is the, the principle when you take blood pressure manually, is that when you put the, the stethoscope on the, um, the brachial artery, you can't hear anything. And then the blood pressure cuff very, very slowly occludes the blood vessel. And just before it shuts the blood vessel down, the blood flow becomes very, very turbulent. And that's what you hear as the Korotkov sound. All right. So if the artery has got an internal restriction, whether that be from atherosclerosis or from a dissecting event, then the flow will be turbulent because it will be narrowed and you will hear the same noise that you would hear as you would get when you are letting the pressure off of a blood pressure cuff. So that sort of pulse that you would hear. And if you hear that, it indicates that there's a problem. The second place that you can do it, this is the, the vertebral artery comes up within the um, foramen transversarium, and then it comes very close to the surface, just around the back of C1. So effectively, just behind the ear, close to where you would expect to find, so there's the um, lateral mass of C1, there's the mastoid process, so just, just around this region here is where you would auscultate to see if there was any bruise, pulsing noises, again, um, but this time indicating flow within the vertebral artery. All right, now if you were to rotate the, the head a little bit more, then you're creating much more stretch through this side. So I'm rotating our neck to the left-hand side. That puts stretch through the right vertebral artery. Okay, it's provocative. So before you do the test, consider whether or not you deliberately want to stretch the vertebral artery. You know, this is effectively a mains test. So you are you are stretching it. So if there is a dissection event, do you really want to do this? All right, so auscultate there, and you can increase the possibility of hearing it by turning the head to the left. And if you want to do auscultate the right one, you need to, sorry, the left one, you have to rotate in the opposite, opposite direction to the right. Okay, so those are the two zones that you would auscultate, internal carotid and vertebral artery. Okay. Let me switch cameras. Any questions at all? Oh, Devon, these two first tests, they were for ligaments or for the neck instability? Yes. So which we discussed the, before. That's exactly right. So they are ligament assessed. They, the, the, the rotation one where the SB is moving is checking the um, uh, the alar ligaments of the upper cervical, C1, C2, and the um, sharp purser test, which is the anterior posterior, is testing the transverse ligament. Okay, but another question. Hmm. And why do we need this? So to exclude general instability or to exclude, I don't know, uh, something, ligament injury after trauma or... Why do we need to test this? Because um, one of the issues associated with, um, trying to get it back up. Da, 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 da. So right. you mean it may cause dissection of the artery? Um, no, so what I'm saying is one of the risk factors for um, dissecting events is, um, Hyperflexibility and ear down loss, which is a connective tissue disorder. So if you've got a connective tissue disorder, it means that you're, you have an increased risk of vascular problems of the neck, and you may be able to pick up possibility of um, instability in the ligaments. So the test is to see whether or not there's generic instability, which raises the risk factor for um, arterial problem. Okay, this one is clear. Yeah. And what about your management of neck pain or headaches? As I remember, yeah. you showed us some mobilization techniques with rotation. Yes. Do you remember? Uh, I don't yeah. remember, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so my mobilization techniques, 
it's I think it's, for me a lot of the headache related problems are to do with the um the, the muscular components so a lot of work will be that I would probably aim to do would be on uh sort of myofascial trigger points it would be on the suboccipital musculature um and I find myself nowadays working much much more with uh, static inhibition, ischemic compression, so, you know, sustained compression rather than repetitive mobilizations, um, and acupuncture. Um, I tend to do more thoracic um, manipulations and mobilizations. I'll do cervical traction, lots of inhibition, but I, I won't tend to do too much nowadays with, um, with neck rotations. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah? Yes, thank you. I think that's it. Any, any questions in the chat from other people at all? It doesn't look like it. I think no one is all here. All the rest are left. Yes, all the rest. They left. Oh, all left. Oh, and yeah. they don't speak English mainly. Yeah, I understand. So okay, well, I hope that's um, okay for Tatiana to translate. Yeah, we will do our best to yeah. make people have a normal video with a normal translation from Tatiana. Yeah. Okay. She may, I don't I don't know how she's gonna do it, but I'm sure I'm sure she will. Okay. Again, yeah. Thank you very much, Devon. No problem. Thank you. Good luck. Bye bye.